Ja, hallo und herzlich willkommen zu einer neuen ähm, Runde The Future Be Now. Transmedia Storytelling Berlin, Patrick Möller und ich, Dorothea Martin, haben heute einen Gast aus Kanada, weshalb ich auch sofort auf Englisch switchen werde. Welcome Corey King, um, uh, with whom we're going to talk about um, storytelling in augmented reality games. And um, Patrick is going to do the conversation while I'm going to do the monitoring of the social media channels. So if you have questions during this live talk with Corey, feel free to ask them and just add the hashtag TMSB. Um, and I will monitor the questions into the talk. So Patrick, Corey, welcome. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for being our guest today, Corey. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this interview and to uh, this talk with you. Um, can you just give us a very short introduction about yourself and your company and what you are doing, please? Sure. Sure, I'll try to keep it short. Um, so, um, well, my name is Corey King. I'm Chief Executive Artist of Zenfry. I hope that's actually like a title that catches on. It means actually CEO and Creative Director. Uh, so it's a pretty selfish title, but that's the one I took. Um, and uh, Zenfry is a creative arts and entertainment company I founded with uh, my wife. Uh, and we create films, uh, we've published books, we've had gallery art shows, and we're currently working on an augmented reality video game. It's my first video game or even technology-centric project. It's called Clandestine Anomaly. It won uh, Game, game R, the best augmented reality game, at uh, Inside AR in Germany. This year, uh, for the pre, like a pre-beta, pre-alpha even version of the game, and uh, we start traveling all over the world now, talking about it, and we're just ramping up to, you know, we finished development, we're ramping up to do production, and uh, we're just about to jump in to actually create the game. But it is a geolocative augmented reality game. The whole concept is that you'll fill your entire neighborhood uh, at GPS locations that are specialized to you, so you know it'll know where your park is, or you'll teach it where your park is versus a school versus other things, so it customizes to your neighborhood uh, and, and makes you feel like you're, you and the neighborhood you're in is the backdrop of a, like an epic sci-fi conflict. Wow, that sounds really interesting. So um, for the first question, how did you come up with the idea of doing this augmented reality game, Clandestine Anomaly? How, um, were there, was there the story first or how, how did you come up with that? Well, I, I, um, I, came, I came up with the idea for this game um, about four hours after having my first iOS product, about three or four years ago. I didn't know what augmented reality was. Um, I just sort of had an intuitive sense of possibility. Um, and I've always been, like, the way I sort of always generate ideas, I just, you know, I put in some music, I go for a walk, and the environment just kind of transforms around me into story. So I, I almost think I have an augmented form of imagination as opposed to wasting the brain's resources in creating everything from scratch. You'll sort of, you know, your sidewalk will become a trench and the buildings over there will become a fortress. So it actually saves you processing power when you're, when you're imagining that allows you to uh, create bigger, more epic and more detailed universes. And so when I held the iPhone in my hand, Uh, and I looked, and I, I just kind of thought about it after a couple hours. I went, "Holy cow! We can actually soon do this. This could be a real thing, you know." Uh, and, and for me, it's it's both interesting in that you're you're now being able to tell stories on the largest canvas of the entire world. It doesn't get it. It will eventually get bigger than that, but we have to colonize some planets first. So for now, you know, the biggest canvas possible. And then it also. Um, It also is sort of the most one-to-one -one correlation, uh, the purest um, form of creative expression for me because it matches most closely with how I generate ideas. So, you know, most mediums, there's a translation process. You know, you have an idea and you have to make it work within a film or within a book. I don't think AR is there yet, but the whole dream of it is that eventually it's, it's so similar to how I come up with my ideas that it could be the purest form of expression. Okay, so um, when you came up with this idea um, about um, using your um, what is around you uh, to, to tell a story and to bring up um, all these nice things, um, did you then go into the, the part of storytelling? Did you write down your story or did you, um, just, com uh, did you just combine the storytelling and the augmented reality while you were um, coming up with your story? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, 
it's sort of, it, I mean, each story I come up with kind of has a different evolution. I would say this one, uh, strangely, actually, it's not normally this way. The first one went, let's tell a story on the biggest canvas of the world. And uh, how do you do that? No one's done it, so the rules aren't really open yet. So you have to kind of create a fiction around it that allows that to make sense. So, I've, uh, so the epicness around it um, is all sort of tailored to AR. It's specifically designed for AR. Part of the reason we chose sci-fi is, you know, the technology is still limited, but there's ways that you can frame and formulate the universe that compensate for the weaknesses of the technology. I mean, I think someday you could go on an AR adventure where you're just helping, you know, you know, poor homeless civilians on the street through their, you know, tragic stories and have these very small, intimate stories. But at this point, uh, I don't think you can do that very well. And so, so it was sort of um, a hybrid of, of what's possible and, and, and the story. But it, it is a deep story universe. I've now been talking to executives who, who run, you know, major IP-focused companies and writers who have written major IPs, and they've all told me that what you've written so far, having not even released a game, uh, when it comes to the canon, is um, ex is a lot. Like my first universe bible, which was before I had anything on the project, any engineers or anything, was over 200 pages long. So the story came before I had engineers, but um, I was sort of using my gut feelings of what was possible. Okay. Can you, can you give us just um, a short insight um, into this story that um, you use in, in this kind of game? Sure. Um, I mean, uh, I like to keep the specific details, especially since we're so far away, under wraps. Um, but I can give sort of a, um, a sense of what the execution approach is, which mm -hmm. is, for me, I think, for augmented reality to be a compelling medium, you have to care about reality, for one. So there's a lot of, like, tabletop games. And those, you know, it's kind of like, uh, it could be a board game, like, you know, it, the table doesn't really matter. It's just sort of a, a surface, um, so which is why we chose GPS. And you should matter as a player, as opposed to just being a character and avatar. If we're augmented reality, you're a part of reality. It's only augmented reality if reality matters. So in our story, you are the main character. Your phone is is not a control interface. It's not like... You know, there's some air games where it's like, I'm shoot. Look, I'm shooting down some kind of a ship, and it's and, and it's trying to make you believe that the, that the iPhone is like a large gun. Uh, and ours, your iPhone is a phone, and you try to build the story and interface around what's possible on a phone. So it's actually a phone that's been hacked with alien technology that allows you to manipulate units, allows you to communicate. You'll get phone calls from characters. You'll text. It's a phone. Um, and that technology that's been added to it allows you to see a new layer of things that are happening all around you, things that most humans aren't supposed to be exposed to because we're kind of too irrational and, you know, morally, uh, you know, well, we still butcher each other. There's always wars. You know, we're kind of not the most upstanding citizens of the universe. Um, and so that's all part of it. And you, the player, weren't actually, like, chosen, you know, um, because you also have to create a story that works for anybody. It has to be somebody who, you know, lives lives in, in Germany, who's like an, you know, 35-year-old woman, or it's, you, you live in Canada and you're like an 8-year-old boy. And most stories have what's called an inciting incident, um, which is like you have a moment where you exist in your normal life, then something happens that transforms you. So you have to come up with a way in AR to have an inciting incident that applies to anybody, anywhere, that gets you into the story. Um, and, and we do that by having this sort of crash ship sequence where an alien ship's crashing, and it's not really supposed to contact you. It's just tried everything else, and for reasons you don't understand at the beginning, it's not able to talk to the people it's supposed to. And as opposed to just letting it be a catastrophe, it hacks, tries to hack nearby phones. It's really a last-ditch effort, and you, the player, happen to get that signal, and then through the actions you undertake in the first you know, episode, you sort of show yourself to be sort of worthy and, and kind of shockingly so, because they're like, well, humans aren't generally that well-received, and this one's not even one of the ones we recruited, so who is this person? And you sort of surprise them and, and hopefully give some hope for the potential of humanity through the actions of the player. Oh, okay. Um, can, you, can you tell us um, some more things about um, how many people um, were or actually are involved in the creation of this um, story and this um, game? Yeah, I would. Uh, I mean, it's becoming hard to track. Uh, at our highest sort of burning so far of people, we've had um, 
over 40 people working on it at once. There's sort of people who come in and come out who, who help at this stage and not necessarily at this stage. Um, I would say in total it's probably had been touched or, or had some element worked on by probably 50, maybe 60 people. Um, and our core team is about 15 people. Oh, okay. And um, during um, this this whole way of creating the story, um, can you can you just uh, tell us um, how long did it take to come up with what you now have and um, how? Sure. Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, what I have now, um, when it comes to the idea of the story, uh, it's constantly evolving. When it comes to the universe, the characters, the majority of that came in like three weeks of typing continuously for 12 hours a day um, and it just kind of poured out of me and then it was taking those pieces and trying to refine it into into a, not only a compelling story in and of itself um, but one that fits within AR. That's still an ongoing process. For me, who's obviously been on it the longest, it's been a, you know, a three year, two and a half, three year process to get us up to the prototypes and things like that that you'll see on the internet. Um, that was about six months of a full team running with funding, but for me, I had worked much before, and I've worked many months since, and um, we're, we have funding now to do production, uh, over a million dollar budget in production, and uh, with that, we have, you know, uh, I'm not saying when we're releasing, but there's at least a year left of work. Wow, okay, that's, that's still um, a lot of time. Um, to go um, for for this game. Um, so, um, are there any chances that um, I, who am interested in augmented reality games, um, can have um, a look or uh, try it for myself already? Is there some kind of, let's say, um, better product or or something like that, a test uh, version? Uh, not not yet. There's no beta yet. Um, I mean, if you meet me, if I happen to be stumbled into at a conference, for instance, I do have sort of a, a tech demo prototype of some of the core features, like the ability to place an object anywhere on the map, hold up your iPad, and then it looks, it's where you place it on the map, um, mm -hmm. which apparently was a, a big feat, um, and, and we've been successful in doing that. So if you meet me at a, at a conference or something like that, I mean, I'm probably not going to one in a while because i got to actually make the thing. But as ha had you, we would be able to um, show you there. Um, we have a lot of interest in beta. We, the website for the game currently is clandestineanomaly.com. There's a little newsletter button. We haven't sent out a newsletter yet, so I'm just saying that because we really don't spam anybody. We probably don't talk to them enough. But um, through that, we are going to send out a call for beta once it's ready. And... Um, and I mean, I think we're going to have a lot of beta testers, but if you if you get on that news list, you'll you'll be one of the first to know when there's something to play. Um, but right now, our beta is scheduled for about four or five months from now. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, when it comes to new experiences or um, skill levels, um, have you had to learn new skills or new things um, just to make your idea um, happen to to create this augmented reality game? Uh, most most definitely, maybe not in the way people think. I often have people ask me, like, how did I jump from filmmaking to programming? And I'd say I still don't know how to code at all. I have no idea. Um, and that's one of my personal weaknesses, obviously. And as a company, we come from a creative background. So our engineering staff actually comes from a different company, local still, to Winnipeg, called Evident. Um, but when it comes to uh, what did I have to learn, despite not learning coding, um, I went from making little art projects that cost at most $10,000 to um, over a million dollar project managing 45 people. So yes, I had to learn a lot. I went from kind of being, uh, I mean, I'm still kind of, I'm not a hippie, but I kind of went from being like a kind of like whatever, man, kind of, you know, just have fun, make the art to trying to become more, mix that art with uh, a little bit more business acumen. So learning business, learning management, learning um, Learning how to work within, I've never sort of worked with a writing team, you know, it was always me on my own uh, for the most part. So there's a tons of stuff I learned. Uh, not, not anything that's easy to sort of broadcast over, but um, there's still a lot, lot more to learn. I still haven't finished a game, so I still got to learn how to finish a game, you know. 
Mm -hmm. um, so when, when you say, um, and, and you already told us that um, you are now in, in production, um, when it comes to the story, um, is the ending of the story um, open or is it still open? Or um, can I, as the player, um, decide where the story goes and uh, which ending really is happening? Is, is um, that part of your uh, creative process of, of mm -hmm. uh, telling the story? So for so there's a couple things that are always difficult with games that offer uh, choice, which is um, we're actually trying to create, uh, like, and it sounds already crazy, like we're making a game that's never been done before and I've never made a game before. On top of all that, I'm also trying to set this canon up to go across mediums if it's successful. And we already have kind of timelines of where we would link the movies in and where we would link. So, so due to having just a canon and due to the fact that if you want a sequel, it's really hard to start off of having three completely different endings and then trying to make a sequel. Um, it gets very expensive. It's just very prohibitive. Um, and so uh, there's sort of, here's how we look at it. So there is the event. Like you could say a car crashed. The car is going to crash. You cannot stop the car from crashing. However, what changes is your relationship to that event and how you feel about it. So, um, and not that there's a car crash. We'll say a character, you know, somebody may die. And if you're on one side of it, you go, yes, yes, he's got him. And if you're on another side of the game, had made different friends, had been told different things about the story, uh, you'll be, oh, tragic hero. What a sacrificial guy. So, you know, the event will stay the same. But it, it's to me, it's sort of, that's more like how real life is. There's a lot of things in your real life that are outside of your control. But your opinions of them are shaped by your education, by your social group, by, you know, the influences in your life. So really, it, it, it's more about being influenced. And you can, you can sort of, maybe, I don't we're hoping that you can go through the whole game and you can think, wow, that guy is terrible. Or that, those things are terrible. And if you play it differently and become friends with different people, you'll see the whole thing in a completely different light. So, um, and in some ways, that's it, it's it's about having like empathy and being open to multiple possibilities and not necessarily believing whoever has the nicest smile or whoever you relate to the most. Um, so there is differences how you how the ending uh, impacts you, how you understand it will change, but the events, the canon events, will be fixed. Okay, okay. So, um, would you say that the storytelling um, part um, and the game part, um, well, not would you say, but um, can you can you give us an impression about how balanced it is? Um, since you, you just mentioned that um, the end of the game um, influence can influence me in a different way, and I can I can see it from different sides, and I, I totally agree with what you just said. Um, but can you just go a bit further and explain how how the balance between storytelling and playing the game is? I mean, I, we haven't necessarily figured that out yet. That's something that we're still working on. We've brought on, we've sort of been adding people to our design team with the more core design experience uh, to make sure, I mean, because ideally the thing with games is, is unlike movies and stuff like that, I mean, they can still be affected by things. A movie can be affected by horrible sound. Like if the sound's just terrible, it doesn't matter anything else. Uh, in games, it's kind of like if the gameplay's bad, it doesn't matter. A good story cannot save a terrible game, and a terrible, and a great game can save a terrible story because people are like, well, the story's just terrible, but it's so much fun, who cares? Um... So we haven't necessarily got the balance yet, but for my like my point of view, my perspective is I don't differentiate. I try not to differentiate. When you actually play the game, there might end up being due to just you know how it ends up being put together or how that that there is like you know I hate games where there's this rigid like here's the cinematic now go play for 20 minutes here's the cinematic um, and if we default to that, that is more out of like technical or budget limitations. Ideally, I think it's an experience. And you should not really be able to differentiate where the game starts and where the story begins because if the gameplay isn't informing the story, uh, really it's not telling stories through gaming. It's really telling stories through film as a crutch to tell your game. So I can't say we're going to execute on that uh, appropriately or if it's going to keep being this boxed in kind of slight storytelling in the game part and slight game in the storytelling part, which is what a lot of games do. But my hope is that 
it all is a cohesive experience and uh, that people hopefully do not differentiate between the gameplay and the story. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, you already told us that your game, um, when when it is finished, can be played everywhere in the world. Um, you you gave the example of um, a player here from Germany and um, um, a player from Canada. Um, when it when it comes to games like this um, that can be played everywhere, are there some certain obstacles um, that you had to? kick out of your way to, to really make this experience good for all the people all over the world? Or um, was it just the easy way of, we want to tell our story in this way, and that's it? It's a huge challenge for a couple reasons. One, there's not, like, you know, we have map data, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the map data doesn't really, you know, there's limits to that. There's limits to how much we can access that. We don't know how tall the buildings are. We don't know what the temperature is. Like, there, you can have all these different data sets, but there's not sort of like a, a concrete single place to go for all of these different data sets. And certainly, we don't know what what the ambient light is. You know, if there's a street light on, like, there's just not that data. Uh, similarly, like, I don't know the specifics of of you know where your park is compared to where my park is, and we didn't necessarily develop an algorithm to figure that out for us. It's sort of user focused. What we had to do is basically limit the game to sort of being. There's some parameters where the game centers around you, so it's kind of like wherever you are, it'll happen. Uh, the game centers around a home base that you declare, and then the game centers around what I call like it's a terrible title, but this is just what I call internally specifically generic locations. So your park around you is a specific place. The idea of a park in general is not a specific place, but the vast majority of people have either a park or a field nearby them. So I don't know anything about the park that you're going to be at, but you're going to tell me through the events of the game, through questions the game asks you, where that stuff is, and uh, hopefully that drives um, setting up the map. So I mean, most places there's, a, you know, there's stores, there's schools, there's churches, there's, you know, there's things that are permeate almost every culture. Um, and it's just certainly cultures that have like the infrastructure of iPhones and things like that. Uh, and so those locations, we had to sort of limit our, our things that take place in a specific setting to places that exist everywhere. So it doesn't necessarily know much about your specific park, but it knows it is a park and it's nearby you. And so yes, I guess there is challenges. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I think it is really... Um, um, hard work um, to to think about all these different uh, locations and find a way just to present those things to the players actually. Um, while you are still in production with uh, Clandestine Anomaly, uh, do you already have um, new ideas of um, other alternate reality, um, augmented reality, sorry, um, games or um, experiences or things like that? Yeah, I mean, even with Clandestine Anomaly, Clandestine Anomaly is the first in what, you know, the second one is Clandestine Persist. That's the current title. I, I may change it, so don't hold me to it. Uh, and we have about seven of those planned out just for this core game. When it comes to totally different IPs, totally different, not related, not even necessarily sci-fi, uh, I do have lots, all kinds of different ones. In fact, uh, I mean, I don't want to go into too much detail because I haven't, you know, I, can, I don't have the funds to, like, stop people, and I don't necessarily... But, I mean, I, there's one that's, like, a children's game, um, an IP that we have developed to a certain degree. We're calling it The Rocketeers, and, uh, you know, you have these... It's for kids more, and you have these little companions that you build rockets with, and you try to get them to different planets. And there's one I have where you sort of... An idea I have where it actually involves... Instead of augmenting the sky, it's the ground. You sort of create this portal in, in your ground, and you grow a garden around the portal, and... People can share messages, you know, so you can see a person in China through their AR hole, and I don't know. There's all kinds of, honestly, it's just going to get crazier, and the more da data we have, like right now we're sort of having to go, well, we don't know where buildings are specifically. We don't know where this is, so there's a lot of, a lot of things that I still think are a viable experience, but it can get much more ridiculous. I think it'll get to a point where, you know, as opposed to giving your girlfriend or wife or boyfriend, I mean, there's girls listening, but I'm speaking specifically to you, um, the, um, 
you know, instead of giving them a card, you could create for them an experience in AR. You know, they could be wearing these glasses, and when they enter the house, it triggers, you know, raining of flowers and, you know, whatever. You know, fantasies. You, you could sort of have fantasies surrounding you all the time if you, if you so desire, which it may be scary for some people, but I think most of us spend most of our lives in one kind of fantasy or another, whether or not we're spending our time reading some really terrible magazine about a celebrity or reading a book. You know, being on a book, being on a bus reading a book is not that different than being on a bus and having the environment around you transformed. As long as there's a clear differentiator between where the reality is and and the fiction is, then I think it's it's fine. But th there's there's a lot more, and a lot of it's tech driven. Um, so yes, there's lots there's lots more ideas for sure. <laughs> Great and and do you see uh, how do you see the the future of augmented reality storytelling? Uh, do you see that something like um, more and more storytellers will um, will catch up with augmented reality and and tell their own stories, or uh, will it be just um, an experimental playground where every, everybody is still uh, trying and and using uh, new methods of uh, technology uh, just to tell their story. How do you see that? I I actually think that at this point, if I just quit today and left, that somebody would still come around and make this a viable medium. Um, and my whole my whole goal is hopefully to try to create, you know, not conventions. Like I don't want I'm not a guy who, like set down the rules, but hopefully. You know, at least in some capacity, I can show the ways that it can be viable and, and attract more people to it. But I do think that if we can get the fidelity of the experience up, if you can get suspension of disbelief to work, where people play it and they believe it enough to not really believe it, but to buy into the story, I do believe that lots of artists will come. I think it, the more tech focused it is, the longer it takes. Like gaming now is becoming more and more story focused. Uh, initially, it wasn't. So there's always this trajectory, and I think the more it's tied to technology, the slower it is, because storytellers like don't generally know much about technology. Um, but once it's as easy to make as, say, a film, once there's standard practices and things, I, I I see this as being a major medium. Like I see this as being, you know, like there's films and TV. I see augmented real interactive augmented reality storytelling as being, you know, as big as gaming, but it's told in sort of a different way because it's a different medium. Mm -hmm. And um, since we now talked about storytelling a lot and about um, how uh, you came up with the ideas and um, also about the future of augmented reality, uh, I would like to address um, one of the last questions uh, more on the technical uh, topic of using um, SDKs or similar things to, to come up with all this. Um, when I get it when I when I get it right, um, you are using uh, the Metayo engine. Is, is that right? Yeah, Unity is our game engine. Metayo is handling a lot of the AR stuff. Yeah, and I then there's some, there's some stuff we have to do in between with maps. You know, it's it's Google Maps currently. Google Maps, Unity, Metayo, kind of our trifecta, and then we have to do some stuff to kind of hook it all together and make it talk to each other. Ah, okay. And um, so, um, from from the creator's point of view, was it um, was it very easy to find your way into these uh, programming things? You already told us um, you are still um, not the programmer, but um, you are still working on that skill. Um, but was it easy to make the first steps with, for example, Metayo or Unity? Um, as the game engine? I mean, for me, I, I look at it more holistically. I mean, I, I don't want to promise people I'm ever going to learn programming. Uh, my sort of creative endeavors aren't so specialized that I plan to, you know, I plan to make a bunch of games, I plan to make a bunch of movies. Um, I just need to know the toolkit enough to direct people on how to do it. So I see it as akin to I know how to use a camera, but when I make a film, I'm not holding the camera. That's somebody else's job. Um, and so, I mean, it's all just about finding the right tools. Do you, do you want to shoot your film this way? Do you want to shoot that way? How do you, what, what effects do you want to have come out? And it really just becomes about a, a checklist of, like, cost, you know, how much resources it will take to build, and how much can it do what we already want it to do. Um, I, I think it's very fortunate that we have things like Mateo, 
as I said, when I started this, I didn't even know what AR was, and, and I would have tried to invent it if it didn't exist, but obviously having it exist is, um, well, it saves me a lot of time, and it's not something I'm really interested in. I mean, uh, if you look now, you're starting to see Mateo is one of the first ones, Euphoria was there, but if you start to actually look, there's a ton of companies, a whole bunch of companies popping up to either compete with Mateo or compete as an advertiser or, or like, you know, to do um, architecture or it's like, whatever, I'll do anything in AR. What, what AR lacks is people who create actually genuinely good, high-value content, and content's always king. Like, TV is fine, but you don't watch TV for any other reason at this point than to consume awesome content. And the internet, you primarily, you can do work on the internet, but you can, you know, most people consume awesome content. And um, so I don't see myself as needing to pioneer that, and I much prefer other people to handle it uh, so that I can focus on being creative. It's like, it's just like asking me what kind of paintbrush do I want to use, and I go, well, which paintbrush will get the idea I want? Currently, Mateo is the paintbrush that we need and the paintbrush that we're using to tell the story. That's a good comparison and um, a very well one for uh, the ending of our show because we already are online for 30 minutes now. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you very much for taking the time and being our guest today and um, for answering um, our questions. Um, since we are running out of time, uh, I, I uh, want to um, promote um, our next session in about two weeks, not in about, but in two weeks. Um, as our guest then, we will have Joanna Penn, and we will talk ab with her about um, storytelling, writing your stories, and how to market them. And um, so it might be interesting of, um, for the one or the other of our audience and, and watchers. Um, so again, thank you very much, Corey, for being our guest today. It, it was very interesting and very informative. I think a lot of people can take away their things and their parts from what you said to really going into their own experiences with augmented reality and storytelling. Thanks thank you. you very yeah, thank you very much for having me. I greatly enjoyed it. I guess the take home for me is like, you know, I, I still don't know engineering. If you have a great story idea, just hunt it down or find the people who can do what you can't do. Anything's kind of possible and uh, you know, if you want to keep following us, we have some big news that's probably going to be dropping in a couple weeks, so if you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, uh, or clandestinomaly.com, and uh, I, look for, I, ho I hope that my interesting talking turns into a great game and that we can all be back here talking about how awesome it is in a year or so. Great. We, we, are, we are really looking forward to it and to have you again here in the show and to see a lot of your next projects and to talk about them. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, and... Thank For you. our watchers, see you in about two weeks. <laughs>